I hope that you heard in those words some social concerns. It's kind of an odd thing that might be inserted in a song that is attributed to a young woman who's just found out that she's going to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. But Mary's not an ordinary woman. We relate best to the opening lines, my soul glorifies the Lord, magnifies the Lord, as it is in the King James, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he's been mindful of my humble state. All generations will call me blessed. We, we're, we're comfortable with that. We're used to that part of the Magnificat. We resonate with those words, yes, Jesus the blessed, his blessed mother Mary, and, and we can relate to this. It starts to get a little iffier as we go down, although I don't know that it should. The Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. That would be our song of praise and prayer as well, I would hope. Have you noticed how prayer and song are not that far distanced, by the way? We call this Mary's song, but it could as well be a prayer. And elsewhere where it is a prayer, it just as well could be a song. I wonder what that tells us about the way our hearts work, about the way our minds work, about the way our spirits reach out to God in creative and beautiful ways in the same way that he has reached out to us in creation and in beauty. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generations to generations. Yes, we understand we're still good, but now it gets crazy. He's performed mighty deeds with his arms. He's scattered those who are proud in those, their inmost thoughts. Wait a minute. I thought the proud ruled the world. In fact, it seems to me that those who are proud are, in fact, rulers of this world. Maybe not of politic, but certainly that. But definitely industry. It is major corporations that run the planet. And these are the proudest of the proud, the most arrogant of the arrogant. Teams of lawyers that would make legislatures look small by comparison. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Wait a minute. The gap between the rich and the poor in this country continues to grow. The gap globally grows even greater. Hundreds of thousands of people face starvation monthly. He has filled the hungry with good things. How can this be? But has sent away the rich empty. It reminds me of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What Jesus does it mean? He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And here's this reference to covenant, to promises of old. But in Mary's mind, remember, someone very special is about to be born, a Messiah, a deliverer, one who will change things, one who will upset the status quo, one whose kingdom will be flipped upside down, one who won't stay to the established order of things, one who can't be bought or sold, one whose purpose is not oppression but liberation, one who seeks the good of the poor and the rich alike, one who calls for justice and mercy, humility and love, grace and compassion. It's a different kind of song because it's a different kind of baby that's going to be born. Our gospel writer is mindful of Hannah's song as he writes. If you'll turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2, you can catch a glimpse of that. In chapter 2 of Samuel, it is called a prayer, not a song. But again, listen to the similarities. My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. And that's a Hebrew phrase which means my humility has become exaltation. 
My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance, for the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows and arrows, excuse me, the bows of the warrior are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who are full of full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children. Again, seven being the number of perfection or completion. But she who has had many sons pines away. Hannah anticipates when the Lord gives her the gift that she has been seeking, anticipates this turn of order, this new way of being in the world where the barren are the ones blessed. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. The foundations of the earth are the Lord's on him. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked he will, will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. It's a long passage, but I wanted to read this today because I want you to appreciate more of the connection Mary has to other parts of our salvation story in history. I want you to appreciate the way in which Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is echoed previously or actually anticipated in these songs and in these prayers, that the order of things might reverse if the Christian world today would stand on this upside-down kingdom, what a different planet we might inherit. What a different place it might be. If we eschewed the order of the world the way it is, if we rejected it, if we set it aside, and we didn't seek for ourselves power and wealth, position and authority, if we didn't seek to collect capital and dominate, I wonder what would happen. I wonder what sort of order we might enter into. Mary has long been ignored in our church for good reasons. We're Protestant after all. One of the abuses that we have noticed or noted in the past in Catholic churches was the glorification of Mary, the ascension of Mary, and her place in the communion of saints. We don't dispute that she would be a saint in the classic sense of the word, but we have long maintained that the dead sleep until the resurrection, that praying to a saint might have no efficacy or power, for how can a dead person help us, that prayer belongs to the Lord directly. We have rejected Mariolatry, and rightly so, but I think we may have thrown out the baby with the bathwater. Mary is not, as it turns out, an ordinary individual. If you go back to Luke chapter 1 and the Magnificat that we just read and was part of our uh, reading is there, we see that just before she says this glorious song, she's actually in dialogue with her cousin. And before that, I want to focus on the birth of Jesus being foretold briefly. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph and a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now listen to what is said next. Mary was troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this was. But the angel said, don't be afraid, you've found favor with God. You will conceive a son and will call his name Yeshua, Jesus, the Lord saves. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. How is this to be? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Mary answered, May it be to me according to your word, and the angel left her. Let's start there. I think my answer, were I Mary in this situation, would be, I don't think so. What would your answer be? I think my answer would be, well, that was weird. I think my answer would be, um, you know, I'm not really comfortable with this. Could I get back to you? Mary says, may it be to me according to your word. From the beginning, she has an openness and an attitude of willingness in relationship to her God. The next section there, pericope of the scripture, we go to Mary visiting Elizabeth. And this is something that's just really joyous too that we contemplate this season. In verse 41 of Luke 1, Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting and the baby leaps within Elizabeth's womb because she is also pregnant with John the Baptist. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, Mary comes and says hello and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. The angel that came to Mary and made this promise, her openness, her reception of the Spirit of God stays with her, and now Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit as Mary speaks to her, and she prophesies, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. What a fantastic thing to say. Later, it would be said of another anonymous woman, Luke eleven twenty seven. 27, if you want to pop over to that passage. I'll try not to run you all over the scriptures today, but it is an interesting little section. 1, 11, 27. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. What a random thing to hear and to say. But it was a compliment to both Mary and Jesus. The woman realized the greatness of the son, and in order to please the son, she praised the mother. And Jesus replies rather oddly, or at least we've interpreted it rather oddly. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And at this point, we get into some tough things in Jesus' relationship to Mary, uh, but I don't want to skip to that just yet. I want to cover a little more territory. In Luke 2.9, Mary, having visited Elizabeth, having received this prophecy, having dealt with the issue with Joseph and his concerns and the angel visiting Joseph, now gets to the place where she is, has given birth. And in Luke 2.19, we hear, Mary hears from shepherds and angels. Luke 2.19. On Christmas Eve, we'll do angels' songs, but for now, it's Mary's song. In 2.19, the shepherds, the angels sing, of course, in 14, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace on whom his favors rests. And then the shepherds find Mary and Joseph and the baby in verse 16. And when they had seen him, they told everybody about him. And in verse 18, all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said. And now listen to 19. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. You're going to hear this phrase several times in Mary's life. She has a unique ability to take in this word, which has become generative within her as the angel speaks, as the spirit comes upon her. She's been able to take in this word and it stays with her. When she receives it anew, she ponders it in her heart. It grows within her into something very powerful. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And on the eighth day, they named Jesus, Jesus. The name that had been given before he was conceived. 
Very next thing Luke takes us to is the temple with Simeon and Anna. And they bless Jesus. We'll do Simeon's song down the road. But they bless Jesus, the two of them, and it's interesting to hear the child's father, verse 33, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Mary took these things into her heart and pondered them. It says Jesus grew and was presented then at the temple. Here again, we find Mary. In verse 48, she's the first to get to Jesus after his delay, after they've left Jerusalem and had to go back after him. And she must have been feeling at that point a little overwhelmed and a little frustrated. Mothers who've had to find their children know the feeling, fathers too. And she says to him, first thing, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. You can see him, you know, grabbing his arm and kind of giving him a little shake. And Jesus is 12. He's about to become an adult in the Jewish system. Seems awfully young in ours. But he says, why were you even searching for me? Did you not know I had to be in my father's house? And the scripture says plainly, but they, Joseph and Mary, did not know what he was saying to them. But he went to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And listen to what it says next. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart pondered them in her heart. I love it. Mary is there in Cana. You know the story, John chapter 2. Mother, why are you involving me in this? And she says, don't worry about him. Do what he tells you to do, she says to the servants. So Jesus orders the servants to bring water, and water becomes wine. And everybody wants to know why the best wine is offered at the end of the feast. And Jesus' ministry begins. Mary is there encouraging him, launching him. She knows it's time, even when he's not sure. She's there at the cross. She may have been there many, 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 many times between. And I'm going to share a story in just a moment that would indicate she was. But in John 19, Jesus is there explicitly mentioned. And as Jesus sees her, he asks John to take charge of her. He gives her to John in an act of great love and devotion to his mother. We're tempted because of Luke 11. Why don't you turn there briefly? We're tempted because of Luke 11 to think that Mary may not have been esteemed much by Jesus. He says some hard things that we interpret to be sort of, um, well, antagonistic, perhaps. We were just in Luke 11, and the woman calls out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. And Jesus says instead, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Back in 8, we have the whole story. In verse 19 and following. Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near to him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside waiting to see you. So here he is teaching in the middle of his ministry, and it seems that this is an ordinary day, an ordinary event, and they are with him. They are following. They are followers of Jesus. And he replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice, very similar to what was said in Luke 11. And we take this rather harshly. We say, see, Jesus isn't so much concerned with relation as he is with the way in which we relate to the larger picture of being God's children. If we do what God tells us to do, we're children of Abraham. If we don't, we're children of someone else. If we obey the commands of God and give our loyalty there, then we're his brothers and sisters, his mother. But there's another way to read this passage. Mother and brothers are included because perhaps it is they who have been faithful. Perhaps it is they who have been followers. We certainly see Jesus' brothers coming into view later. Eamon Carroll says this, 
The mother of Jesus was present still at the apparent failure of all the great hopes on Calvary. And St. Luke places her again in the upper room, praying for the spirit of Pentecost, promised by her risen son. It is on that note of prayer that the Acts of the Apostles take leave of Mary, the mother of Jesus. It's true. For years I had passed this by, but if we go to Acts, we will find Mary there. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. She's, Jesus has just ascended into heaven, and the disciples are now choosing a replacement for Matthias. And, or Matthias is being uh, chosen to replace Judas, rather. And there they are in verse 14. It says, they all joined together constantly in prayer. This upper room that they had been in when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Tradition has it that Mary was eventually taken to what is now modern Turkey and that she lived out her days there, and that John uh, continued on his mission and did his work. But I just want to invite all of us today to hear Mary's song as an invitation to two things. An invitation to consider again the essential message of Jesus in the upside-down kingdom in which justice reigns here and now because proud have been humbled. The meek have inherited the earth. The wise have been made foolish, and the foolish have spoken of the wisdom of God. The rich have become poor, and the poor have been given what they need to be satisfied. The second invitation that comes to us in Mary's life today is an invitation to be first and foremost willing to follow our God. When the angel comes to her, she says, may it be to me as you have said. And as she learns who her son really is, as she follows his career, through the devastation of Calvary, she doesn't give up. She's there in the upper room. She's there at Pentecost in prayer. She's there through these things. She, Mary, mother of Jesus, is a true follower of Jesus, and so would I be.